Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm Dr. Ben White, in case you didn't know, and uh, this is the Functional Medicine Discussion Group meeting, and um, we've been meeting through Zoom since COVID started. I, I, um, I, I enjoy these Zoom meetings, but it was a lot more fun meeting in person and uh, personal relationships, and so I'm looking forward to the point when we can get back to that, but... Um, so I hope you'll consider joining some of our uh, future meetings. And October 22nd, um, we're going to get a tutorial on the GI map stool test with Dr. Jeff Ingersoll of Diagnostic Solutions. November 19th, um, Dr. Stephen Sanford Lewis will be joining us for some yet to be decided gut related topic. Um, and we're not going to have a meeting in December and I haven't worked out the schedule for 2021 yet. So I guess I better get to work. Um, I, I encourage everyone to participate tonight. And so type your questions into the chat box and, um, you know, I'll either call on you or ask Dr. Elias your question when it's appropriate. And if you're not aware, we also have a closed Facebook page the Functional Medicine Discussion Group of Santa Monica that you should join so we can continue the conversation when this evening is over. I'm recording this event and I'll post it on my YouTube page and I'll include it in my weekly Rational Wellness podcast. And if you haven't listened to the podcast, you should really check it out because we have excellent interviews with many of the top doctors in the functional medicine world. And our topic for tonight is detoxification, transformation, and healing with Dr. Isaac Elias. I want to thank very much Clinical Synergy Econugenics, which is the proper name for the company. Uh, for, for doctors, the doctor line is Clinical Synergy. Okay. And so I want to thank them for sponsoring tonight's event. Um, so Isaac, can you tell us what the what the promo is for tonight? There's there's a couple of specials for everybody. Who's oh yeah, uh, I uh, I mean, so I think the company is it's going to be an email going out. There are two different codes because of some limitation on the website. So one is a fifteen percent discount on all clinical synergy products. This is a professional line, but then I asked them to make a special promo for our liquid probiotics because uh, it's really it's really on a class of its own compared to any other probiotic and I've been importing it from Europe for years it wasn't available in this country and then we reformulated we added our our POS uh, pectic oligosaccharides so I asked the company to do like buy six and get six free so you can really try it yourself give it to patients because it's the kind of product that once you try you know you don't stop using it's an amazing, it's really, I'll share, when I have some section, there are some products that are hard to explain until you try them, you know? It's like talking what is sugar until you taste sugar, right? It's like theoretical. So yeah, it, so it's really the class of its own. So I really, so I asked them to do a special code so people can get a great deal on it. You know, you buy six and you get six free. Great. Everybody's going to get an email. In fact, uh, you may get one from... Uh... Dr. Elias's company and for me as well. Um, and in case I wasn't clear, if you have a question, type it into the chat box and uh, that way everybody can see it as well. So Dr. Isaac Elias is a medical doctor and acupuncturist, and he's been a pioneer in the field of integrative medicine since the early 1980s with a specific focus on cancer, immune health, detoxification, and mind-body medicine. He's the founder and medical director of Amitabha Medical Clinic and Healing Center in Santa Rosa, California. He's a developer of Pectisol C, the only research forum of modified citrus pectin, and many other incredible nutritional supplements, which are available through his company, Clinical Synergy. And perhaps most importantly, besides caring for his family, his patients, and his business, 
Isaac cares for humanity and the planet. And he's such an incredible human being that I'm honored to know him. And thank you for joining our meeting tonight. Thank you. I, really, uh, I, I love the opportunity to come to your group. I like it in person better, it's true. We have some great evenings that are very crowded with people that I already know. But uh, Zoom is, meanwhile, is filling in, you know? Yeah. So now you're going to share your screen and you're going to yes. do a presentation. Yes. So here we go. It's okay? Can, can, can you guys see this? Yep. Yep, oh. we can see it. Okay. So good evening, everybody. And uh, we are going, let me see if I can kind of clear the sharing button, button to the bottom. Good. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about detoxification, transformation, and healing, a multi-system holistic understanding and practical applications. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today, and I'll do my best not to get lost in too many details. And there are certain areas that I will go through quickly because you guys are experts in it, maybe more than me, and you've heard a lot about it. But I want to, I want to give you both a a bigger understanding of det what det detoxification is and you, you usually learn and think about, but also give you today, try to be as practical as I can. Oops. Oops, this. Okay, here we go. So what we'll cover today is we'll talk about a deeper understanding of detoxification, how to design a balanced and powerful detox program, the detoxification is the relationship with the microbiome, which will be very relevant for next month's lecture. Intensive seasonal detoxification. I'll talk a little bit about the difference between a fall detox, which we are, this is the perfect timing, you know, the, from a Chinese medicine point of view, fall started, uh, you know, like three days ago. And, and compared to spring detoxification and what and daily detox strategies and how to avoid detox pitfalls in the healing crisis, which is really something that you really don't have to see at all in your clinic. And again, we'll talk about Galactin-3 and its role specifically today in detoxification and in uh, the microbiome in gut health. And detox challenges and the use of therapeutic aphoresis, it's a lot of my breakthrough work. It's a part when I'm part of the establishment of you know having NIH grants, publishing with Institute like Harvard, you know, really with the leading, leading conventional doctors. So part of my background is that in one level, I am, I am a, I really am kind of like out of the be, bell curve when it comes to my esoteric and holistic understanding, kind of growing with this approach since I was a teenager from, from being in Korea and meditating and doing yoga and spending years and years of two months a year in retreat and learning from great masters in Tibet and treating them and in the same and being a, a creative person in the same time uh, being a solid researcher that publishes regularly and works with you know with dozens of leading research institutes has you know has I know over 60 different patents and uh, you know NIH grants and uh, really collaborating with the people at the top of the of conventional medicine. With the people at the real top, interesting, they are very creative. The ones that are really there, that, that have gotten there, they're often very creative. I learned a lot from them. So when we look at, a, at a detoxification, we want to really see it as a process. And the process is a pre pre preparatory phase, an exposure phase, a binding phase, a discharge and elimination and support and balance. And they of course happen together, except for the, the first stage, the preparatory phase. And this is more when we do a targeted detox, which is very often done in the, in the changing season, the spring and the fall, and done before certain disease treatments, for like, let's say for cancer or after. For example, what do you do after chemotherapy, what do you do after radiation, but we won't talk my main focus in my medical practice is cancer, but we won't talk about it in the context of cancer. Today is more about the gut, because also the large intestine it relates to the lungs, to the fall season. So it's a good season to talk about the lungs. So when we look in the preparatory phase, we really want to have the body-mind scope. You know, we really want to go all over. So from a diet, it's a good idea to start preparing for 
for, for the detox. So if you're about to do a detox yourself or recommend to your, to your patients to do it, it's going to take a few days, a week or two, and start shifting to an anti-inflammatory detox diet, eliminating allergenic foods, and reducing exposure to toxins in food, in products, in the environment. And the idea is one, we are reducing the toxic load in advance, and we are freeing our detox detoxification enzymes, our detoxification systems, so they can actually help us in the detox process. The GI support is very important because the, 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 the large intestine, the intestines in general, large intestine specifically, are really our, our main elimination organ. So, and we really need our microbiome, we really need our intestinal barrier and elimination to be ready. So when we excrete into the gut, there is no reabsorption. So it's a very important stage that we really want to emphasize. Let me just move the picture of everybody to the bottom. Okay, good. And very important, you know, many people detoxify, but not too many people ask themselves, what do we want to detoxify? What we want to get rid of? So that's, so when somebody prepares for a detox, I would ask them, what would you like to get rid of? On a physical level, on an emotional level, on a psychological level, on a psycho-spiritual level. And in this sense, the fall and the spring are very different. The spring, we're coming out of the winter, out of less movement, and we are preparing for longer days, more activity during the summer. So detox in the spring is designed to allow us to be more active, to be stronger, it's more liver-related, muscle-related. It's preparing the body for greater challenges. The fall season prepares for more for the dormant stage. It's interesting, you know, now we are between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's Jewish New Year, it's a time when we kind of, you know, it's a season where we weigh what we did good, our deeds, our positive deeds, our negative deeds, and we balance them. That's very much the fall season, the metal season, the judgment season. And we look at it and we ask for forgiveness. We let go. So a detox is also a process of, of forgiveness, of letting go, of discharging. So especially in the context of the fall, it relates more to the past, to letting go. We're moving into the darkness. We're moving into the end of life from a seasonal point of view, from the annual cycle point of view. And this year especially is a year when we ask, oh my gosh, what a year, what do I want to really let go of, you know? So this is a detox part, and towards the end, when I summarize, I'll talk a little bit about the transformation and healing. That's another part that is not often even recognizing detoxification. Also, there are parts that I will not be able to cover here, which are how every organ responds to the detox cycle. I talk a little, little bit about it in my book that I'm finally going to come up out with, the, uh, which is going to be called The Survival Paradox. And it really explains this. That's not good. Okay. At the moment, let me make sure. Only one slide, yeah, okay. All right. So... After we prepared, we want to expose the toxin and infections. And here today, in the context of, of the colon, we really want to address biofilms, because it's a key strategy in day-to-day -day addressing chronic infection and in, and in detoxification. Because biofilm will bind and sequester toxins and metals, interfere with elimination, nutrient absorption, promote and protect co-infections, and thrive in an inflammatory environment. And biofilm and inflammation are mediated and rely on sticky cell surface protein, galactin-3. Galactin-3 is a building block of the biofilm. It's like the structure, it's like the skeleton of the biofilm. So it's important to really understand the, the importance of biofilm and the role of galactin-3 in this specific context. So when you look at binding, there is a great advantage to using pectasol modified citrus pectin. And the reason is because modified citrus pectin not only break the galactin-3 driven structure of the biofilm, but it's also a powerful binder to heavy metals. 
and a powerful prebiotic. And specifically, if you want to address more issues like toxins within the gut, not only systemically, then you can combine it with alginates, which have a different, uh, a different profile of binding, which I will get to soon. So I just want to mention this, because I, I often talk for an hour and a half and I forget to be practical. So today I made a point of being practical. So once we have the preparation, once we have the exposure, now we are ready for the discharge and elimination. And I'm not going to talk a lot about this because you guys are experts in it. And are, this is such, such, such a, a, a popular topic with different uh, SNPs and different changes in the liver. But in general, if there's an imbalance where phase one is overactive in phase two, which is common, we get stuck with a lot of toxic material in the circulation. But the by the way, Isaac, when we have toxins, how often are biofilms involved? Are they involved a lot of the time? In general, from a gut point of view, they're involved all the time. And the biofilm, we really look at the biofilm as a concept inside the gut. But in the body, the quote-unquote biofilm will be an arteriosclerotic plaque. You know, if when you look that there's people with, with heart disease, for example, the connection between gum disease and the heart relates to the biofilm in the guns, which are galactin-3 driven. So you see studies that galactin-3 promote gum disease and heart disease. So yeah, so these biofilm structure are available in, and inside us, it's where different viruses can hide, et cetera, et cetera. So really, if you think about it, it's, but I will get I have a whole section on biofilm, so we'll get to it. Okay. Because we really have to understand, look at biofilm as a micro environment. And what galactin-3 does, it really, it, by creating pentamers, it creates micro environments or what we'll call in Chinese medicine, box structure, isolated box structures, areas we no longer have control. It's also a place for us to box and isolate things that are hard for us. Toxins, heavy metals that we don't want to deal with for a good reason, and toxic emotion, toxic, toxic traumas. And, but galact MCP, for example, gives an opportunity to open it up and clean it up. So when we look at this, so in many levels, phase one activates a lot of these toxins from a liver point of view, and phase two get it ready, f gets, gets it ready for elimination, for, for excretion, you know, of water-soluble waste. So really, we really have to understand the concept of discharge and elimination. It's a key, key, key concept, bigger than just phase one. Phase one, two is, in, Phase one and two is just an expression of it. What do I mean? If we look at discharge and elimination, the discharge is making something that is toxic evident to the body. For example, heavy metals. And you can see why I'm a proponent of, of, of modified situ spectin because not only it will, be, it will break the biofilm and the pentamers of the galactin-3, and will release the, some of the inflammatory ligands and neutralize them, it will bind to the heavy metals also, which we published a number of papers on. So you get, an, you, you get something that addresses both phases. That's why, for example, in Lyme patients, they will feel really good with using modified citrus spectrum. They will, fight, they will feel a relief immediately. You don't get this, this, this like aggravation because it addresses both of it. So from a philosophical point of view, you are, you, are, you are opening the drawers and you're throwing everything into the kitchen floor. That's discharge. Elimination is cleaning up the mess. So we have to be equipped to do both of them in a balanced way. And here you've got the different B vitamins and cofactors, et cetera, that all of you are very, very knowledgeable, but also you want to make sure you're taking botanicals that helps in elimination, gut, bladder, lungs, skin, all of them. And I'm not talking about this uh, specific formula that it's called Detox Complete. It's specifically designed around this philosophy of supporting the different organs that do this. Oops. Why? Today I'm having some... Okay, here we go. But let me make sure I didn't skip two slides. I didn't. Okay. So 
as we look at the whole process as a movement, we can see the rhythm between preparation, exposure, binding, distal and elimination, and support and balance. And when it comes to, when, when, when it comes to support and balance, we want to also realize that we are bombarded with pesticide and agriculture uh, toxins all the time. We want to make sure we eliminate them as part of the support and balance on a short-term and on a long-term basis, and we support the, the, the microbiome. And that's why I'm talking specifically about this uh, prebiotic and probiotic. Wow, okay, cool. We are okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the microbiome and its, its whole movement from survival to harmony. Maybe it's a great place to look at our body. If we look at our body, we have in at average, you know, it's, I don't know why they say 39 trillion cells. I have no idea. Who, but if you look at the literature, let's say around 50 trillion cells, trillion. Not million, not billion, trillion, which is million times million, or million times a thousand times a thousand. It's hard to comprehend the number. Now, you know how many in reactions every cell, every cell of this 50 trillion has every second? There is argument in the literature between hundreds of thousands and one million reactions. A second in every cell. Wow. So every cell, this amazing body, has 50 trillion cells producing million reactions. I mean, we can't even comprehend the number. We, we, we you know, basically we are, we are right now at 10 to the minus 18. And if we just wait a little bit longer, we'll be more than a Vogadro number. Okay. And so uh, it's, it's, it's really incomprehensible. And all of these cells are working in harmony. And within it, we have a microbiome with there is an argument how many creatures are guests in the microbiome. Some people say 100 uh, trillion. Some people say 1.3 of the amount of cells, like, you know, 50, 70, 60, 70 trillion, a lot of them. And they work in concert with us. We have a symbiotic relationship between our microbiome that have been developed over generation, generations uh, of evolution, and it's actually multi-generational. And the microbiome serves us really well. Just to give an example, if we take a drug like adriamycin, which is a very common anti-cancer drug for multiple cancers, and we take antibiotics, the drug will not work because we disrupted the microbiome. Our microbiome knows to activate the drug that we are using for our own to fight diseases inside our body. That's the level of the wisdom of the microbiome. So when the microbiome is in harmony, it serves us well, but it has the ability to become aggressive when it feels threatened, right? If we look at our survival reaction in reaction to danger, we either survive with fighting or with running away. So the fight response that we have in the running away is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. It's immediate as we know, right? But if we relax, it will go away. If we are constantly under sympathetic pressure, we start getting metabolic changes, increase in cortisol, you know, increase in glucagon, uh, increase, uh, of course, in, 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 uh, in epinephrine, adrenaline, or epinephrine. And as a result, insulin spike, and everything goes in, into, into a mess. Metabolically, our survival protein is galactin-3. Galactin-3 is in charge, is our alarming. It sets up the alarm. And as such, it allows us to respond to injury very quickly. But the response is devastating. It's just like, you know, it's just like there's something dangerous and you, and, and you start a fire to burn it, and then you get a mega fire, kind of what we are living right now in California. Because the injury repair by galactin-3 uses inflammation and fibrosis. So in infections, galactin-3 will respond within 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 minutes to respond very very quickly before any cytokine or before anything else now we have to remember we are not the only one who wants to survive the microbiome also wants to survive 
So the moment the microbiome sense stress, danger, it will activate itself through galactin-3, right? We know it's Borrelia, Lyme disease, uh, Candida, they know how to do it. The moment they sense, suddenly we feel our rush from Candida. Like, no, in five minutes. It knows, it senses it. It uses galactin-3, it affects insulin receptors, and it starts spiking things like interleukin 1b, interleukin 6. And I will share a study on it a little bit later. That is a mega, mega study that we are about to submit to a, to a, to a, to a high, you know, to a high impact uh, peer reviewed jo journal in sepsis. So when you address the microbiome, you got to understand this movement from survival to harmony. So, for example, when we talk about Lyme disease, a patient with chronic Lyme, if they got heavy antibiotics before, it's so much more difficult to help them. You know, I used to treat a lot of Lyme because of family members who had Lyme, but they are all completely 100% back. So I'm back to more cancer. I just take very difficult cases and all of them turn around, all of them. But, and I just never use antibiotics because I understand this movement from survival to harmony. It's built within us the ability to, to thrive with 100, mil, 100 trillion organisms as long as we respect them. So from this point of view, I want to, to talk about the, the, this uh, lecture. So when it comes to the microbiome, there's another crazy phenomena, which is time and space. What is good for us in the gut is going to kill us if it goes through the gut, right? If we get the same bacteria coming through the gut into our circulation, we are dead very quickly. It's called sepsis. And again, it's enhanced and it's created by galactin-3. Ben, make a point for me to share the study towards the end, okay? Okay. Just to give you guys a sense how dramatic it is. Because it's really a, a landmark study that we'll be publishing shortly. So, who are we? Who is the microbiome? It's a high complex and diverse and dynamic, uh, really, community. Uh, I like a lot to use bees as an image of the community, as a ex-beekeeper who is about to start doing it again. About 100, 100 trillion microorganisms, several thousand different organisms with millions of, of communication links. It includes protozoa, fungi, bacteria, viruses. It's not only bacteria, we tend to forget it. And common core microbiome is really, has a, has a multi-generational and there are interpersonal variations that are maintained over generations within family. Fascinating. So the structure of the microbiome is really a glycobiome. There is really highly glycosylated mucus as the epithelial inter interface. And it's separated, really, it's a thin layer of host-derived glycoprotein and glycolipids around the cell surface. So for example, from the image of Chinese medicine, if there are any Chinese doctors in the audience, or people who are interested in Chinese medicine, we really look at the digestive system in Chinese medicine as not being part of the body. Because you think you can eat something, it goes through, through the digestive tract and come through the anus, and it never, we never interacted with this. It's these boundaries that are so important in creating the separation. So the mucosa-associated microbes are important for nutrient exchange. They help us to absorb nutrients, communication with the host, immune system, and pathogen resistance. You know, there's a delicate balance. And of course, when we have dysbiosis, it's thrown off. And it's thrown off if we take probiotics, some studies, in the wrong way in, in mega dosages. We also have to respect how we address the, the microbiome when we want to support it. So the glycobiome really has evolved with, mu with mucose degrading enzymes and mucose binding extracellular protein, such as galactin-3. And these bacterial and mucose degrading enzymes, they disrupt the epithelial junction. So the moment the gut is under stress, we, we are under stress, we have more aggressive bacteria, they bind very strong to the gut and they create leaky gut. I mean, a very 
multiple examples like 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 Staphylococcus aureus and different different other bacteria that use galactin 3 as their anchoring and as I mentioned uh, to Ben before the lecture a COVID-19 spiking protein now this is on the COVID itself it's not that it uses it is practically identical to galactin 3 so it uses the structure practically identical to galactin 3 to attach to the surface and in normal tissue, galactin-3 highest density is in the lungs. So right there. And when we talk about galactin-3 in a few minutes, you will understand a little bit better what I mean when I, when I talk about this, this glycosylated mucus, because what happened, galactin-3 is able to bind to carbohydrates. So, so, so glycoprotein, glycolipids, all of these structures use galactin-3 to bind to create a shield, the pentamer, the biofilm, literally, it's literally a, a shield. I mean, structurally, it's not, it's not an esoteric thing. We know the structure. And then you bring new blood supply. You create an hypoxic environment. You have sticky molecules like integrins. You have lipopolysaccharides. So galactin 3 now carries the lipopolysaccharide and creates a toxic inflammatory response. It's all happening. Really exciting to understand. So the loss of biodiversity, the loss of balance between our self-survival cooperating, because if you think about it, the survival is, is a basic evolutionary for all of us. If the microbiome realizes that for its survival, it has to support us, because when we die, the microbiome dies, it's going to be synergistic. But if it feels threatened, it's going to behave differently. We all went through this situation. We are relaxed and friendly, and suddenly we are threatened, and boom, you know, we are ready to fight. So really, so dysbiosis changes the permeability of the gut, bacterial endotoxin translocation, LPS, which is specifically carried by galactin-3, and systemic inflammation. So really, maintaining a healthy, diverse microbiome can balance, target, and avert a toxic biofilm in the gut's mucosal epithelial membrane, promoting its integrity and reducing to systemic inflammation. Ah. Oops. Moment. Here we go. So there are multiple factors that create imbalance and influence the human, from an, uh, human epigenetics and microbiome. The expression, the stress-related expression. Early life conditions, Maternal microbiome, nutrition, preterm birth, C-section, breastfeeding versus formula, genetic factors, hygiene, diet, antigenic foods, high fat, high sugar, lack of fiber, different medication like antibiotic, stress, toxic exposure, inflammation, lack of exercise, infection, and, 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 and uh, issues of the nervous system. The gut-brain connection, we're all very aware of it. I know a lot of people are talking about it. And again, lack of exercise is a stressful situation because mitochondrial function is not functioning well and you get, you know, and you get mTO1 blocked and you get more anaerobic glycolysis happened and acidosis. So you can see how different things can end up in the same place. So, but this process can move from the localized level to systemic effects. And gut-brain connection is one very good example because when we have... This biosis, we have lack, lack of, of short-chain fatty acid, like lactic acid, the acetic acid, vitamin, bioactive cofactors. You got immunogenic dietary components that they get absorbed into the systemic circulation because of leakage in the lining. And you got endotoxin that is released into the gut, and now it's actually it's moving into the system. And it, it can cause lack and inconsistent production of, the, of neurotransmitters. There are about 200 billion neurons in the gut. And it causes immune dysregulation both on the localized and the systemic level. And that's why, you know, in, in a functional medicine, in naturopathic medicine, in, in the spleen stomach school, in Chinese medicine, we recognize the importance of the gut and the digestion. And also it's how to really change it. So... I want within this to really look a little bit and understand the role and targeting of galactin-3. 
Again, the focus today is our lecture about detox and the microbiome, but again, we'll a little bit expand it because we don't have to stick to such, to a, to a pinpoint approach. So really, it, really, Galactin 3 is start from an alarming, from setting the alarm that something is wrong, to driver of chronic disease. So if you think about what a survival protein does, in uterus and intracellularly, in order to survive, our cells have to develop normally, right? That's survival. That, if you look at Darwin, survival of the fetus, we have to reproduce. So, galactin-3 plays a role in intracellular development. For example, embryogenesis of the kidneys. And it kind of finishes when we are born, because we have the tissue. <laughs> the but then extracellularly, and through membrane receptors, uh, cell surface receptors, when we feel that there is a danger, the cell gets, gets a, a signal, mRNA starts producing galactin-3, it's packaged in vesicles, it's shipped out of the cells, and we got trouble. Usually it's done by macrophage, that goes everywhere, <laughs> but also cancer cells are able to do it in extracellular metrics. Uh, uh, and <laughs> stem cells can do it. So it really will activate the initial immune response to acute infection. So for example, uh, and, we, and so example, the study that I mentioned before, we just finished a study that is an integration of, of evaluating patients who are, who are being hospitalized in the ICU with sepsis who have no pre, pre-existing condition like kidney disease, heart disease, cancer. And they have no signs of kidney damage. And they are hospitalized in the ICU. And, we are, and in the same time, we did an animal, a, a rat study on, a, on, the, mo, on the most translated a sepsis model, sepsis AKI, acute kidney injury, which is a huge problem that is overlooked in medicine. Uh, that is called a sickal, sickal ligation puncture. You puncture the sickle, and the animal gets seps, starts getting an infection within a minute. So I have an NIH grant for this, and my, my, my approach was that galactin-3 will spike before, in, before the cytokine. And indeed, galactin-3 spikes within minutes. It peaks in two hours, two hours, and it's down in eight hours. If I take these animals and I give them pectosol for one week before the injury, even not after, before, okay? I reduce the mortality by threefold. I lower the galactin-3 level spike after two hours significantly. I lower dramatically the level of interleukin-6, especially 24 hours, and I prevent kidney injury dramatically. And this study is done a part of my development of developing a galactin-3 aphoresis column that can pull everything out because that's what a, sepsis, a septic patient needs in the hospital. If we look at the septic patients, the level of galactin-3 admission within the study will determine, one, who will die from sepsis later on in the ICU and who will get acute kidney injury. Highly significant. Kind of mind-blowing, you know? Remember, clinically, no signs of kidney injury. You don't know. You don't know who is going to, to die. Galactin-3 will tell it to you in advance. Why? You understand why, why people ever take MCP? That's only one. I mean, this is just one example of category we never talked about. Sepsis, AKI. We always, we always thought it's a chronic thing. Actually, it's an acute thing because it will instigate recruitment and infiltration of immune cells to, to sites of infection, and then you get your mess, your immune response, your cytokine storm. I've been talking about cytokine storm for years. I mean, you guys know, I lecture about it to you guys. And now suddenly we can, because we can't treat the, we can't turn the damn galactin-3 off. It's like, it goes crazy. And it drives systemic inflammation, pro-fibrotic, proliferating link cascade, anchored inflammatory and adhesive molecules, promotes biofilm establishment and drives cancer growth. How can it do it, and can it do such a different thing? It can do it, I'll show you in a moment, or two. I have a slide. Now, now, how quickly does modified citrus pectin work? If somebody were 
in an acute situation and, and starting to go into a cytokine storm and they were given modified citrus pectin, could it have an effect at that point? It's a great question. So from us, it's my other part that we'll talk at the end, my medical device, I want it to be very dramatic. But MCP will make a difference. For example, we have a very well-known environmental, uh, he shared, he, he shared the, the, the story, and I forgot his last name, in, uh, in uh, San Diego, which had a, a strong infection in his, in his hand and was going into sepsis, he didn't respond to antibiotics, and the doctors were ready to amputate the hand, and he went on high dose, high dose pectasol with the probiotic, and within 24 hours it resolved. Wow. Yeah, because this, this animal study is showing the power of it. So you just take a lot, you take 20 grams a day, you just load, load your body. But of course, when somebody is under total storm in the ICU, they can't take anything already. But that's really the value of this. And the problem is that we're not aware that our chronic disease are often a small, tiny insults, infectious, emotional toxins on a continuum. And each of them does a small damage and we never recover. You know, when I talk about galactin-3, and maybe I'm going, uh, not really off topic. I mean, I talk a lot about it in my book. Really, I use the Buddhist concept. It's like a bird flying in the sky or like writing in water. You want to respond and to have no leftover debris once the inflammation goes away. Galactin-3 prevents this from happening. It keeps going. And, and then suddenly the, the, the cytokine that was so necessary in the short term become pro-inflammatory and cause all of this damage. Could the collectin-3 be given uh, intravenously? No, MCP. I mean, there is work on drugs with it, but the much quicker way to do it in such situation is to pull it out with, uh, with apheresis. And, but for right now, for us, yes. I mean, for me... MCP is my key supplement right now with what's going on, you know, and that's definitely what I mentioned. Again, this is just for doctors, it's not, it's a limited lecture. So if we look at the galactin-3 structure, we can see the N-terminal structure. When I point with an arrow, you guys can see it, right? The arrow? Ben, can, can you see the arrow? Yes, we then can you see, see the ligand, you see the ligand. The, yep. This is a carbohydrate ending, a galacturonic acid ending of different different proteins, different, different ligands. You know, people are aware of lectins. Galactin is a, is a galactin binding pr a, a protein. Lectin in general is a carbohydrate binding protein. So galactin specifically bind to carbohydrate and then it creates these nasty pentamers, either by a pentamer binding straight to a pentamer or by using ligands. So if it can bind to dozens and dozens of different ligands, it can have such diverse effects. That's why you understand, we do research on one of these ligands, on one specific one, let's say VGF, or VGF receptor that calls VGF. So you take a VGF receptor, it will cause VGF, it will cause new blood growth for cancer. Well, that's only one ligand out of dozens that MCP, that galactins we can carry. Well, guess what? It can carry it anywhere in the body. Crazy, you know? So one thing which is amazing, a paper that was published in October 2019 that kind of made me commit to putting more energy into my medical device and putting it out because I realized, my God, I can save millions of lives even if I just want to meditate now and not, and, and not work as hard and I'm working hard because raising money is tough. With, uh, is it... We realized we, there was a study that showed people, patients going cabbage, doing coronary artery bypass graft, okay? When I say study, it's 1,200 patients, 23 ICUs in Europe. No pre-existing conditions. You know, most patients with cabbage just suddenly they find out they have, for the first time, pressure, they don't have any, any often they're not sick before, and they are rushed into doing a coronary artery bypass. The levels of galactin-3 before the surgery 
if they had no kidney disease, no heart disease, no before, will determine who will get kidney injury in the ICU afterwards and who will end up getting cardiac remodeling, cardiac fibrosis, and chronic kidney and heart problems and mortality. The level of relating three before the surgery. But then they did a study on mice and they, create, they stopped the circulation to the kidneys for a short term. And they stopped the circulation to the arteries, to, to their legs. Nothing happened when they stopped the circulation to the legs. But when they stopped the circulation to the kidneys, galactin-3 got excreted. It went to the heart. It mobilized macrophage, and it created heart damage. When they used it on mice that were what you call knockout mice that cannot do galactin-3, or when they gave our MCP to this mice, Okay, no damage to the heart. But here is a crazy thing. When they took the knockout mice and they injected to them bone marrow that could produce galactin-3 and they created the damage to the kidney, the signal from the kidney damage, remember when I talk about the alarming, the alarming, right? The signal from the kidneys travel to the bone marrow caused excretion of, of galactin-3, they travel to the heart, mobilized macrophage, M2, you know, inflammatory macrophage, and caused heart damage. Really, that's like a landmark study. It was in one of American Heart Association journals. It was important enough that the editorial board commented on it, how important is the study. Wow. This is why when I told Ben, there are so many papers now. So galactin-3 lattice formation promotes the establishment of biofilms because it's a dynamic extracellular gel-like polymer formed by cross-linking with surface glycoprotein and glycolipids. So all of these different glycolipids can attach to the galactin-3 pentamers. Galactins, glycoprotein, branch, and, and glycans. And the, the references are in the, in the button. Oops. Okay. So galactin-3 promotes adhesion and invasion of pathogens. Elevated galactin-3 expression in damaged epithelial gut lining will, will bind to pathogenic bacteria, viruses, fungi, allowing for tissue adhesion and immune invasion. And pathogen will exploit galactin-3 to augment their capacity to colonize and survive. That's the survival. You can see what I'm trying to to convey when I teach, and it's not as sometimes as convenient as giving protocols, I want to give people the image, the survival image. You can see the pathogens also want to survive. You know, this is part of what's going now in our country, this divisiveness. It comes from a survival response, from creating different realities, different microenvironment, right? If any of you didn't see the, the documentary, The Survival Dilemma, you got to see it about how how the social media is creating what is happening now. Why? It creates microenvironments of people that have the same thought, that have the same belief, that surround themselves in isolation. And why do they do it? Because they can advertise the same thing to this group. And then this group doesn't like the other group. And that's why we are in a losing proposition situation. And that happened between us and the environment, global warming. It's all the same. It's a survival reaction. It's a fighting survival reaction. So if we can recognize it, it becomes very, very important. So galactin-3 will drive the cycle of dysbiosis because it will affect the leaky gut. It will promote IL-1 and, and uh, you know, uh, interferon alpha. It will promote uh, you know, IL-17, IL-6, TNF-alpha. All of this is well published. And again, and, and will overburden the liver and will cause multiple multiple uh, toxic effects. The liver is a fascinating organ. That it, it gets both venous blood and arterial blood. And it's part of its role in dealing with past stuff and detoxifying and dealing with the future in, in generation. It's the only organ that has this kind of behavior. Okay. okay, so, oops. Okay, so, Modified citrus pectin, what it does, it binds to galactin-3. It takes out, it, it dismantles or blocks in advance, like what it did in our study with the mice, this 
ligand that causes the inflammatory response, and then it breaks down the pentamers into monomers, and it breaks the microenvironment. So this is from, again, one of American Heart Association journals. So in the context of the biofilm, it will disrupt the biofilm to expose toxin and infections. So again, it's, it's fundamentally different than regular fiber because it has a much lower molecular weight. It has a low level of esterification. And it's, of course, it's, it's, it's clinically proven. So really, when it comes to MCP, there's only one MCP, only pectosol. And I don't want to go in great detail about the detail of MCP. We don't have time. But the neutral sugars, the arabinose, the xylose, and rhamnose are very important for the immune system and for detoxification. And also, our MCP has 10% of rhamnogalacturonan 2, which is an immune enhancing compound in mistletoe. So, when we combine it with sodium alginates, we get a wider range of detoxification because the uh, alginates are powerful in binding to radioactive isotopes, as, it, as is pectosol. We published a paper on it. It binds to dioxin, dioxin like compounds, pesticides, heavy metals, toxic bile, and preventing reabsorption. So, when you combine them, you get detoxification in the gut with the alginate, and you get systemic detoxification with pectosol. So, MCP will inhibit the critical step for biofilm host, host adhesion because the galactin 3 and the ligand is what really promotes the biofilm extracellular adhesion. I'm going to go a little bit faster on this so we have time for questions. So, you see, these are some of the sticky, these are some of the ligands that are bound to galactin 3. You know, the gags that affect neuroinflammation, fibronectin, and self surface adhesion. Integrins that, by the way, will will uh, will affect thyroid function and and a different proteoglycan, and that's the process how it happens. I don't want to go spend a lot of time with it, but initial adhesion, attachment, adherence, and then the process starts with the uh, EPS uh, with a uh, with 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 uh, with the extracellular polymers. That, that are producing in the whole, the whole cycle. So, biofilm also sequester heavy metals. So, biofilm bacteria sequester heavy metals, EPS and polysaccharide bind to heavy metals, and bacteria in the biofilm adopt a more toxin resistant phenotype than free swimming bacteria. Very important. So, the moment we break the biofilm, we, we reduce the toxicity and the danger of the, of, of the bacteria. And there are various mechanisms to protect against heavy metals, such as, such as efflux pumps, where they can kind of throw the heavy metals out of the cell, similar to drug resistance in cancer. So when treating biofilm, you need to address release of heavy metals. So that's the advantage of the binder. Remember in the beginning, the advantage of the binder of always using pectosol, you are binding to heavy metals. It's well published. I think we have four or five papers, but we know high affinity to lead, to mercury, to arsenicum, to cesium, to, to, uh, to uranium. We published a paper on, on, on a family with high uranium showing increased excretion from the gut. Now, so, is there any question about uh, MCP's ability to actually bind? Can, the, can MCP actually physically bind the metals? Yeah, of course, it does. There's no question about it. We actually, proved, we actually showed it. It's well known because of, of its side chains, definitely. But it has to be, has have low esterification. That's why pectosol is unique. You have to change the structure to allow room for the metals to actually bind to the, what we call the hairy sides of the pectin. Like a few, a few, a few slides ago. To, to, to these ones with, you know, when you see the RH, R A R A R A R, these are these are these are the areas where the where where the where the heavy metals. But it has to be charged. If you if it is sterified, there is no longer a charge, you know. So that's that that that's, that's the issue. See here, when it is sterified, they are like like here. Here where it is sterified, there is no more charge, so it can't bind. It's neutralized. And this is why it needs to be 
that's why it's so important to have a low a low a low esterification oops let me just try to move fast enough to where we were so for example studies showing that mcp reduced pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, you know when so this is in the nervous system when microglia cells treated with lps it significantly look how significantly it reduced the uh, compared to control interleukin 1b interleukin 6 very significant again these are the nasty cytokine that we cause problems and so specifically for the microbiome our mcp was shown in a number of published papers with the usda uh, again the, it's an independent papers most of our papers are independent I mean, anti antimicrobial effects against multiple strains of Staphylococcus aureus, including MAUSA, and additive and synergistic bacteriocidal effect with combination of MCP and, ceph and cephotaxin, which is very important in Lyme. So this is all published papers. And MCP demonstrated enhanced lactobacilli growth. That's a prebiotic quality of it in human fecal culture. An anti-adhesive effect against the... Uh, Shigella toxin, a shiga toxin producing E. coli, inhibiting binding to cell, and reduction in cyto, of, of, of the cytotoxicity of the shiga toxin. So, so again, the multiple action of, of uh, pectasol, it inhibits inflammation and fibrosis, protects vital organ, enhances and regulates immune function, inhibits adhesion and establishment of biofilms, support healthy microbiome and intestinal integrity, and bind systemic toxins in every metal. That's more in the context of today. We didn't touch cancer, or autoimmune disease, or other stuff. That's not the topic ah. today. Okay. So environmental aggregate agricultural toxins. We have to be aware of them. And one thing that I neglected to be aware of until the last few years is the critical role of pesticide in glyphosate. One of the big issues with, with, with pesticides is that they will accumulate in the ground. So for example, in Israel, where, the, where DDT is, is banned since the 60s, you still find high level of DDT in, in, in adipose tissues of breasts, you know, 50 years later. Wow. So that's a problem with pesticides. So many countries now are banning glyphosate. And Mexico just joined the list. United States, it's incredible. It's like in the United States in 2012, 1.1 billion pounds of pesticides a year. 1.1 billion pounds, which means between three and these days it's more. So four pounds of pesticide for each of us wow. a year. I mean, just, just imagine, just put it in grams, okay? Put it in grams, two kilograms. So every day we have to take six grams of pesticides. That's how much it's put in, in the ground. And it's going to get to us at some point because it's bioaccumulate. So again, a lot of political pressure, as, the, as you know, but so now there's this WHO is taking a stronger, uh, the, the position is stronger about the danger in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I'm gonna go a little bit quick so we can co cover everything. Uh, strong, uh, co strong correlation with the thyroid cancer, with, with increased level of corn and soy that are genetically engineered to be round up ready. Look at this. Look, look at the correlation between this and, 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 the, and, and thyroid cancer. Kind of crazy, right? Wow. And connection with autism, like in, in the Central Valley, is very, very, very clear. So, wait, wait, how did I get here? Oh, from here, okay. So, uh, glyphosate also can insert itself into protein synthesis. It's, it's, a, it's a glycine analog, and as a glycine analog, it has an effect on leaky gut, causing like celiac-like disease. And also, of course, it's a narrow excitatory effect because glycine is an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter and it exchanges with it because it's so similar in structure. And uh, as, you, as you can see, and then uh, it will uh, bind, become an excitatory uh, neuro, neurotransmitter in the brain. So there's an argument if how much glycine can really 
uh, inhibit glyphosate, how much it, it there is literature that say that it can, it can exchange with it, but it can definitely prevent the binding of glyphosate to the mucose membranes of the gut. Because glyphosate is water soluble, it's very well absorbed. And it's small, look how small it is. It's nasty, it's like a tiny, you know, a glycine like the smallest amino acid. And so you can understand why it's absorbed so easy. So glycine will help to prevent the, the attachment to the gut. So glypho, and this, so we created a formula with four ingredients that kind of addresses the issue, which we integrate into the detox program and we also integrate into the into 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 the daily life and we're trying to address both pesticides a lot in the gut because we get them all the time and we are using a whole kelp that has the iodine and other and other trace minerals to allow to exchange with bromides chloride and fluoride so the formula really, really includes a kelp which is uh, i mean is as organic as we can get is uh, and uh, yeah, so it's very clean and it has a standard as iodine of and the amount that we have in a daily dose is about it's about you know 600 700 micrograms so it's really a dose that is, is a it's a right dose it's not very high but it's and then if you take double it's 1200 we use regular citrus pectin which is highly branched it's different than mcp because we want it to bind to fat-soluble toxins and pesticides. Many pesticides are lipid-soluble. We use glycine and we use sodium alginate because sodium alginate is a different profile and it works very well with citrus pectin. So it will help to, and sodium alginate will help to absorb glyphosate when paired with a positively charged molecule. And in this sense, I will talk about what you can add to it in a moment. So these are some studies showing how kelp enhances intestinal barrier function again and prevents LPS from which is negatively charged and uh, kelp is positively charged uh, so uh, from a gram negative uh, bacteria it's important for us to try to protect it from creating a systemic effect this is research about glycine leaks to higher level of, of glutathione. So glycine is really increases the production of glutathione in a significant way. And uh, also, also helps survival in patients following self-harm. So when we look at, so this is when we look at alginates, when alginates, uh, when people kind of take paracrate, which is an herbicide, there is a significant improvement in survival with alginates. And alginate is an efficient biopolymer for the absorption of herbicides like Dequat and Defensoquat. So it's really used for toxic swamps. So the combination with high molecular weight, pectin helps to do it in the gut. When you take MCP, of course, you have the systemic and peeling effect, and that's why we combine the glyphodetox together with spectrosol, together with the probiotics. So citrus pectin is well established. It can bind to DDT, to DDE. All of these are fat solubles. So you can see the difference in the dosages in adipose tissues, in the liver, in the kidney and the brain of the different DDE, and DDE plus pectin, very significant, all of them statistically significant in animal studies. And also in general, fibers enhance the fecal excretion of dioxin isomers and specifically pectins, we do it very well. Now it's interesting when we combine alginate with chitosan, which is, which is uh, available in the shell of seafood and the the chitosan is, is, uh, is positively charged. So when you combine them, you actually can bind to glyphosate and remove it from water. The reason why you don't use just chitosan is because it doesn't bind to herbicides at all. These are different published papers. So combining them, it's a good, and in my next formulation of this product, I will be adding this into the formula. 
So the next, so now I want to talk about specifically about the next generation of symbiotics, prebiotics plus probiotic. And this is really my, my favorite product that I've been importing from Denmark for years. And now I reformulated together with using technical legal saccharide. I showed you all the research, right, on, on, on the, our POS, Pectus as the POS. So we are adding it to the fermentation process. So why this product in a class of its own? Because it's not, it's not like another peel or another. It's actually live food. It's the, the eight different strains of probiotic are fermented on organic molasses. So the molasses is what allows them to grow. There is no more sugars left. It's fermented on 19 different organic herbs, and it's fermented on the pectic oligosaccharides. And what you get is you get a live, a live product. Very, of course, it's different than, than kombucha in the power, but it's along the same principle. And you feel the difference in your gut from literally the first dose, the first dose. For the people that it makes a difference, it's something that, as they say, you don't leave your house without it. So it's composed of probiotic, prebiotic that create a, a, a synergistic effect. And it really has life, it has energy on its own, and it, it's grown in, a, in a, everything is grown bio, biodynamically in a biodynamic farm. And we use organic berry juice, not just flavor, but actually the juice from organic, from different berries. So very unusual product, and because, so it's really not about the number of bacteria, and that's the issue of loading the gut with tons of certain bacteria that may not be the right for person, but it's about allowing the gut to heal itself. So there are eight different, there are eight different probiotics, shouldn't be pre it's a typo, and different lactobacillus, I'll show you, pectic oligosaccharide and 19 organic herbs in the organic molasses. So it, during the fermentation process, we produce two types of organic carboxylic acid, lactic and acetic acid, eight strains of live and active probiotic, the herbs, and the pectic oligosaccharides. And the lactic and acetic acid lowers the pH below 3.5 when where harmful bacteria cannot live. Lactic acid is used as a signal substance in the body to promote our immunity and acetic acid promote peristalsis so you get normal bowel movement. It acts as a fuel for muscles and brain and antimicrobial and fungal and the organic acid help really to keep the intestine time tight as a source of nutrition for intestinal cells. So these are the different uh, bacteria, bifidus, longum and lactis, lactobacillus acidophilus, case, rhamnos, and salivarius, and lactis, and streptococcus, thermophilus. And these are some of their unique properties and the ability to, ad to adhere to the intestinal mucosa, resistance to acid and bile, and the form L and D, they're almost exclusively the L active form. So they really offer very, very, very nice synergistic qualities. And these are the different herbs that they are grown. So the herbs are, the herbs are there, you know, the, 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 the herbs are not, are not in the in the formula, you know, you don't get herbs, but it's cultured on the herbs. So these are very all organic, of course. It's a large selection of different detox and digestive herbs that really support the digestive process. And the idea really is to feed the bacteria with a, with a nourishing food, similar to my uh, mycophyter, you know, the mushroom immune max where I where I grow it on herbs. But, you know, some of these herbs like oregano have antimicrobial properties. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's so part of the, won't that kill the probiotics? No, no, they don't. Because they are really used just in the fermenting process. And you don't want to look, it's a good question. Absolutely not. We check this, the, the, the spores are active. But it's really, really got to look at it as a whole formula. Not, not as, one, as one ingredient or, or another. This is comes from really from the digestive school in, uh, in, 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 in the European herbal uh, pharmacophia. It's different than, uh, than like Chinese, but you can see 
the licorice, which will help on the level of the stomach, the, the, the fenugreek, which has metabolic function, and there's the warmer qualities, but a lot of spices, you know, dill, oregano, parsley, peppermint, you know, these are edible herbs, you know, that, that we do the rosemary, and we know, just like we know about, about, about curcumin, these are digestive herbs. They have the digestive system. So we are, we are extracting these this actives and allowing the bacteria to activate them. And I think about it, it's really similar to the, to the concept of, uh, of, uh, of really of the mycophyto. And then the POS prebiotics they stimulate the activity of probiotic and they also help to produce short chain fatty acids like acetate, again, acetic acid that are present. So these short, uh, short chain fatty acids are very important as energy sources. And they're very important for the physiological function of the gut. So we get, so it's the kind of thing actually that you take it and you just feel a difference. <clears throat> so this is some about our studies with spectic oligosaccharides, that are fibers are known to be prebiotic and the uh, lower molecular weight in, in, in desterification enhance the anti-adhesive activity of the pectosol. So this is from a published paper. It's the first report of POS selecting for higher lactobacillus levels during mixed batch fecal fermentation. So when you ferment feces, the POS specifically stimulates the healthy bacteria. Very interesting study. It was done on pigs with the USDA. Oh, wow. Okay, so I'm just going to pass a little bit quickly. These are some other studies showing, again, that the PO, POS in, in cefotaxin was additive effect and synergistic in two strains. And the organic molasses, again, so this is a product, and it can be taken, <clears throat> you can take, you know, one to two tablespoons twice a day. It's very good to combine with spectrosol. It's an ideal combination. I actually put it in my pectosol or you can put it in different drinks. Now, since pectosol is a binder, yes. it's okay to take other nutrients with it? Yes, yes, it's not a problem because it, it's really nutrients. I mean, you, you want to take it 10, 15 minutes before food. So I won't take it like, you know, if you take a multivitamin, which you take with food, but even 15 minutes before food, it's enough. It doesn't interfere with the absorption of, uh, of calcium or magnesium because it has a high affinity for heavy metals. And we have, we, have, we have published on it. It's a very good question. So this is, again, what we discussed today, the prepare, expose, bind, discharge, and elimination. And the system, uh, you know, we covered a lot with time. We went by really quickly. And so now I want to talk to you about something that I specifically specialize with, is, which is therapeutic apheresis. Therapeutic apheresis is a process where we, it's a medical procedure that involves removing whole blood from a patient separating the blood into individual component, uh, meaning the first thing that we do actually is we, this is not as good of a, a description, we separate the cells from the plasma, and then we, we take out specific components from the plasma, then we put them together, and then we return them. So from a research point of view, I, I have a company called Elia Therapeutics where I'm trying to develop the galactin-3, a column just for galactin-3, which is galactin-3 antibody, because if selectively we, we can remove it, we can affect AKI sepsis, it's our primary target, also CKD and NASH, which is a huge problem, and enhanced immunotherapy and good for lung fibrosis. So it's a single use of heresis, and we are now in the development stage. We've been doing it for eight, nine years, seven, eight years, and we are we hopefully with the right fundraising, we'll be in clinical trials in about a year. And one thing that we have done to prove our concept, so these are the different ligands, some of them that can attach into the galactic. You can see lipopolysaccharides will, will enhance sepsis. Collagen, elastin, laminin will 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 enhance fibrosis 
Uh, here we Mac and one and three and CD45. We, if you block them, you shut down the immune response. Cadarin, desmoglein, and the uh, integrins, wherever they are, maybe we didn't put them in this integrins, will affect sticky molecules and cancer metastasis, etc., uh, etc. Et so what we do when you use a blocker, when you use a blocker, you are you are exchanging with the ligands. When you use an apheresis model, you are pulling out the whole thing with all the ligands in it. So you get rid of everything. And that's why it's so powerful and works so quickly. So for example, we did a study with Harvard when we injected MGH in a, in a, in a, in special pigs that are developed for xenograft transplant. And in the study, we wanted to see if we if we create inflammation in the skin by injecting something called complete Freud adjuvant, similar to BCG, you create very big inflammation. And you can see this is the active group. There is no inflammation. Look at the tissue compared to the control group. Look at the redness and lack of resolution and ulcers and look at the tissue. Very dramatic. This was published. We published this uh, with uh, me being first author in one and last author in the other, with Harvard in the Journal of Clinical Aphoresis, the main aphoresis journal. These are two different papers we published. In the clinic, we use different different way for right now. In the, in the clinic, I've pioneered the use of LDL aphoresis, which is an FDA-approved device that is paid by insurance space for hypercholesterolemia, and I use it for inflammatory conditions, together with supplement, together with special IVs, in cancer therapies. It helps chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy. My biggest focus now is chronic kidney disease, degenerative diseases. I've now turned around eight out of eight chronic kidney disease patients. Some of wow. them, some of them on dialysis or pre-dialysis. All of them together with MCP. So really, for the people who can afford it, it's, we actually don't charge a lot, but it's an ex the filters that cost thousands of dollars. It really makes a difference. And of course, in mast cell activation, in pandas, in, 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 in mold exposure, and detoxification. Amazing results. I, I, I myself make sure to actually get this treatment. I got one yesterday. It's really a proven regen, regen, regenerative treatment. For the people here who use regenerative medicine, who use, you know, different biologicals, you know, what they call acellular biologic, tissue biologics, it's a completely different response when you do the aphoresis and then you, you do the regenerative treatments. And so the, as the aphoresis protocol that we do specifically include IVs that we introduce during the aphoresis, and immediately after, and it also allows drugs and compound to better reach targets. So we do, do it before chemotherapy, before immunotherapy. We know now that immunotherapies, checkpoint inhibitors, if the patient galactin-3 levels are high, for example, they will not work. So here we are moving just a little bit of galactin-3. We are moving about 30%, but we're moving a lot of other inflammatory and, and growth compounds. So that's an example. So I actually, in most centers, the doctor just prescribes, I look at every bag. So what I've found, it's called the signature. So you can see like the large intestine, this patient has a tumor in the large intestine used to have. You can see the accumulation, you know, crazy, right there. And this is a picture from today. It's not as good, but I don't know if you can see the bubble, this is just a bubble, but you can see this circle with, with empty and this kind of line going up. So when I come back, it's clearly, for me, I, I tend to see this visually. Well, let's say esophagus and the stomach. So I ask this, the patient, how is the stomach doing? You say, and they say, it's my last place where I'm suffering. So whatever came out, these are all debris. These are all growth factors, inflammatory factors. It's unreal. I'm going, I now presented in the three last International Society for Aphoresis conferences. And now they are finally realizing this stuff is good for inflammation, but I'm going to present these pictures like in, in, in 2021. I got to start collecting them. It's unreal, the signature, how you can see the patient problem, like the bag. And people know by me, I will diagnose them just by the way the bag looks. You will see a kidney shape. You will see a heart shape. It's unreal. 
Anyway, this just came today. I rushed to put it in. That's why Ben doesn't have it, <laughs> right? Because it's, uh, it, it's just mind-blowing for me. So you have to be open, you know, no, no concepts. Just open your mind. And you so go. I also discovered this specific device can cause an anaphylaxis in certain patients that they weren't able to solve it for 25 years. But now that I moved to this device, I was able to solve it very simple just by giving high dose magnesium sulfate IV, it moves you from a sympathetic, from a survival mode to a balanced mode, and the patient no longer responds. So now we just submitted the paper. We got accepted with, with revision that we just submitted. Seven cases in the bigger center in the country for aphoresis that could not handle the treatment, even with IV steroids, all got anaphylactic shock. They used my protocol. Not all of them are tolerating it. So you basically save the life of seven patients. So this is a, this is a, my presentation. Uh, this is a picture when I was teaching meditation retreat in Israel about the, before the COVID, about a year ago. And so this is my email for any of you who need my website. And this is for, for clinical synergy. If you need any help, please call us and the company will help you. And I just finished at eight, but if any of you still want to to ask me any question, let me just. Well, we have we have some questions here, so I'll just go ahead and ask ask them to you. Um, of course. Somebody asked about uh, pro uh, spore based probiotics versus uh, other probiotics. What do you think about the bacillus strains? You know, I can't say that I'm an expert in the different strains. You know, I must say, I'm just, a, I'm a great believer of that for probiotics to work, we got to respect and nourish the microbiome. That has been my approach. So that's really what I, what, what I presented. And you are welcome to add other strains, but really it's once you try, you see, I, I usually, usually I don't sit on a product and push it like this. But I tell you, the patient of mine was so anxious about this this, this uh, synergy eye that they will come and buy supplies for six months because they have to bring it from Europe in case it runs out. It just changes your gut. And why? Because of this synergistic... Uh, the, the, no, the, and I think with the SIBO issues, loading the gut with too many probiotics is can be an issue if it's not the right profile for the patient. When you give the gut the right food with a little bit of bacteria, which is very, which is of different properties, you allow the body to, to readjust. Well, just to play devil's advocate for a minute, one of the arguments for spore-based probiotics is because they're encapsulated in a spore, they're gonna get all the way down to the large intestine without getting broken down, whereas right. other probiotics get killed on their way down. Totally, to the totally. And this is why our, our, uh, the Synergy I has, the probiotics are in a sport form, in, in a spore forms. So when we tested the activity, it takes 24 hours and then they get activated. So they, they actually don't get killed in, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the intestines. So these are like lactobacillus and conventional strains. How do they end up in a spore? It's something about about the process. We've actually we've actually analyzed it, and they don't they they you know when you give them the the active conditions they get activated and start growing. So we we haven't had an issue. And one of the things that you see with them from a clinical point of view, you know, I'm not like a a gut. A, a gut bacteria expert, expert. One thing that I've seen most dramatic with this is for, 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 for example, patients with ulcerative colitis that are bleeding in the rectum. You will see an improvement in the first 24 hours. So it goes all the way to there. It changes the motility. You got to look at this as changing the health of the gut. Okay. Yeah, it's a different concept. That's, that's amazing if you can see positive improvement in somebody with ulcerative colitis oh, in 24 yes. hours. Yes. Um, somebody asked about histamine excess and does modified citrus pectin help to reduce histamine? It will, it will indirectly. And the reason is because the histamine reaction is 
is is is often cytokine storm driven and it's galactin 3 driven for 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 example uh, and not not only histamine but for example the bradykinin response with the ace2 receptor with the covid is galactin 3 driven so yes definitely so you will see decrease in an allergic responses and i think it's one of the mechanism why why we see improvement in a uh, in a uh, in Lyme patients, definitely. Uh, somebody asked, um, can you speak about the role of Chinese medicinal mushrooms and inflammation? Yes, it's a great topic. So Chinese mushrooms are very rich in oligosaccharides. And they're very important in regulating the inflammatory process and the immune response. And that's why they are so essential, especially now. I mean, right now with what all we are going, my two main products are MCP and medicinal mushrooms. And specifically, I, the reason why I use the Mushroom Immune Max, because I grow the mushrooms on herbs that are immune enhancing, anti-infectious and anti-inflammatory. So it's very similar concept. So this is the one thing that I never skip. Somebody asked uh, how do you get pectisol to mix better and Dr. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Yeah, yeah. David Trader made a suggestion, and he said that he found that by first putting eight ounces of water into a shaker bottle with a metal ball and then adding the pectisol C, that helps. But do you have any other suggestions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great, that's one way. Remember, it's a, it's a saccharide, so it doesn't get broken with heat. So what I do is I put a tiny bit of regular water. So I, so I, I, I put the pectisol and the lime one dissolves better. And I put a tiny bit of, of regular water and then I put hot water. So it's not boiling, but it's hot. And, I don't, and you don't touch it. See, the pectosol is such small grains that if you right away shake it, it will clump. Let the water absorb for two or three minutes. And then you can add, then you add a little bit more water. You stir really well and you add more water and it will dissolve perfectly. The trick is not to mix it right away, to let it absorb the water first. Ah, uh, interesting. Good. Then, and then once it's warm and it's not too hot, so it's like around like 40 degrees centigrade, that's when I will add the, the Synergy I into the mix. Great. So I think that about wraps up, wraps up the question. So I thank you so much for joining yes, us. Somebody asked me about mixing with applesauce. That's actually a good idea. It's not a problem. What was that mixing with applesauce? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 not a problem at all. Okay. Okay. So thank you everybody for for tolerating me with so much so many details. No, it was great. We really appreciate it, and thank you everybody for joining us. And we'll see you next month. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Thanks.